friend. Hey, girl. Hey. So we're back. We are back, and it's been a lot of nonsense, friend. Well, it is, and it's, you know, I think I feel, I, I'm interested in how you feel. On the one hand, it's really important to talk about these things because we need to identify what is real and what is not real and help ourselves and our community kind of think thoughtfully about what is at stake and what is happening. But also it's so ridiculous. Like we said in our last episode, which was a, a YouTube live or one of the last episodes, which was a YouTube live when we were talking about, there was something about Trump being on stage and just juxtaposing her with Vi- Vice President Kamala Harris that felt like we were in an alternate universe. Because on yes. what planet should those two people be both running for the president of the United States of America? Right. Like on the one hand, someone who has worked really hard, studied really hard, worked her way up in public service exclusively, held elected office in the local state, has been a senator, has been a vice president, right, is part of a like huge network of HBCUs and national sororities and has done service at all levels. And then there's Donald Trump. <laughs> Comma. I don't even know what accolades to insert because in my opinion, there are none. Reality. screwed people are. over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, filed bankruptcy a bunch of times. Won't release his tax records. 34 felonies. I mean, what we... Doesn't pay his subcontractors. Um, housing discrimination. Misogyny sexual assault. There there are so many places we can go, Um, but they do not rival the accolades, the state's personship of someone like Kamala Harris. And so the news, unfortunately, keeps reminding us that Earth is ghetto. So what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about a few different intersecting things. Yeah. One, um, I think we need to talk about the power of Taylor Swift. Not your favorite person. Stop giving that caveat. I called this woman the bang in the lip one time, and now I don't like Taylor Swift, okay? This podcast exists in nuance, all right? She's perfectly fine. Go, Taylor, go. And I'm so happy that her and her boyfriend are not dominating the news right now. She's in the news for something much more important. And I think also begs the question about what is the responsibility of celebrity when it comes to what's at stake in our election? Stir that pot, friend. Okay, so can you give us a little background about what Tay-Tay did? Okay, Tay-Tay. Um, so Tay-Tay had not really been saying much. And everybody was waiting to see if she, and I also remember Beyonce, were going to come out in support of Kamala Harris. People were kind of uh, suggesting that one or both may show up at the DNC, or maybe they were going to use that opportunity to endorse her. Now, Beyonce has still been mum, which is very obvious to me. Except her music. Is- she did give the rights to uh, be able to use her music, which I do understand is uh, likely a nod to support, okay? But uh, more could be done for sure. Not about Beyonce right now, because we know that the beehive, y'all get worked up, y'all get, we're talking about Tay-Tay. So, uh, (laughs) Tay-Tay then, girl, recently after the, was it the night of the debate, Margo? Right after the debate. Right after the debate, girl. Tay-Tay came, she tweeted, or she X'd, or whatever you call it. No, now. she posted on Instagram. Oh, oh, she didn't even go on his platform. Uh-huh. Good for her. A picture of her with her cat in full endorsement of Kamala Harris, and she signed it, the cat lady. The childless cat lady. And she linked in her stories different websites that individuals can use to register to vote. And so what happened is, I mean, in addition to that post getting a lot of attention, we saw as a country an incredible influx in young people, particularly registering to vote in the 24 hours after her post. Absolutely, which is what we want. I mean, no matter how you feel about either candidate, we need people to participate in this part of their civic duty and obligation, especially at a time such as this. And so that is huge. And it is a great way to use your power and your influence as a celebrity. Absolutely. And 
we talked about this a lot on this platform, right? That it's really going to come down to a handful of tens of thousands of votes in certain states. Yeah. And so that is why it's important for all of us to engage because depending where you are, your vote really does impact the outcome of this election. Okay. But where we go from here. So huge impact. I think it begs the question of if there were other people who did something similar, would there be similar responsiveness? Exactly. Young people follow people I don't even know. And so who are those people? Yeah. And and if we can go back to your point about tens of thousands of votes in particular states, it's also important to remember that sometimes celebrities can activate a base that otherwise might be politically apathetic. That's right? what I mean. Yeah. So if you're listening to us, then we would assume your vote is foregone. And we said this in our last episode. We're talking about people who otherwise would not come out to vote. And that is why it is important. So, yes, Absolutely. That is- Absolutely. So who are those other celebrities, singers, actors, influencers who young people are really following and looking up to who can come out and bring out the people in North Carolina and Michigan and Wyoming and Arizona and in Georgia? And Other, uh, North Carolina. North Carolina. And, le- and let me just say also, Em, that we know based upon a little bit of a deep dive we did, did to prepare for another episode, that once again, MAGA Republicans, they have the influencer game on lock. They have people who are their talking heads, who are their pundits. And these are not people who are just on Fox News. These are mm-hmm. individuals who are existing on YouTube, who are podcasters, who are using social media to do nothing but spread hate and vitriol. So when we say, what is the role of the celebrity and the influencer, that is not like out of thin air. We know that it's being used on the other side against us. Absolutely. Now is the time to tell folks about today's episode. So today's episode is sponsored <laughs> by Whoop. Whoop is um, a Boston brand, guys. Oh, I didn't Did know, you know that. that. No. So I've used Whoop for the last couple of years on and off. So I let me just say, I have been a Whoop user for a really long time. I used it. I got it for the first time a number of years ago and used it pretty diligently after I had my third baby because okay. I was so tired and she wasn't sleeping well so I had no idea how much I was sleeping Okay. and then I as you know I've struggled with my sleep for a long time then I stopped using it um, and then over the last year I've started using it again because I was sleeping so much so much but not feeling well Mm. and so it was the first time in my life that I ever was sleeping consistently really well and not Ever since I was a child, but I still felt like crap. Okay. So really using my data for my WHOOP has has been part of my wellness journey. So how does it work? So it's tracking? Uh- it tracks everything, but it, there's no interface. So it's not like an Apple Watch or a Garmin or anything like that. It's just a band. And okay. then on the bottom is the heart rate monitor. Ah, I see. Okay. And you get the best data if you wear it consistently. I wear it pretty consistently, though I take it off for events and stuff. Okay. And the more data the Whoop gets, it calibrates to your body. So it, and instead of, I mean, it does do calories and heart rate, but that's not the focus. It tracks sleep, strain, and recovery. Hmm. And so it's in these cute circles. Okay. And so based on your activity and your weight and your body and your age, it gives you an estimation of ideal sleep. Oh wow. Okay, and that's then, helpful. And then so you get you get a bunch of data in the morning, right? So how did you sleep? Did you sleep your like suggested number of hours? You can get a hundred percent on sleep, but for example, today I had really bad recovery. I was in the red. Which what does is not recovery good. mean again? Recovery is like how your body has recovered after a night of sleep. Interesting. So, for example, I worked out harder than I have in a really long time yesterday morning. Okay. And we had a drink yesterday. So, for me, because I'm old, um, that is like a crazy day. Okay. (laughs) And even though I slept well, my body isn't primed for exercise today. That's how I interpret the data. I see. So, like, after we filmed today, instead of... I mean, I wasn't going to do this, but say I was like, I was going to go on a five mile run. I would be like, oh, my recovery wasn't that great. And I want to go to an exercise class tomorrow. I'm going to go on a walk. Well, this is so important for someone like me because 
I'm I have not a lot of data or knowledge around uh, physical activity and fitness, right? I am learning all of these things. So understanding how my body actually responds or doesn't or how I should treat it exactly. is so and important. So for example, there's a couple other things that I really like. I don't use all of the tools. It's an app, so you can have it on your phone or you can do it interface on, on the website too. Um, and there are communities you can join within the app. I don't do that, except there's two things. One, there's a journal that you can fill out every morning okay. about like how active was your day? Did you take any, did you drink? Did you take drugs? Did you drink enough water? Were you active? Were you stressed? And so if you do the journal a lot, it tracks that data. And so it can correlate like, oh, I'm noticing that when you don't drink enough water, you don't yeah. sleep well or whatever. So that's one thing. I don't really do the journal that much because I'm pretty aware of what I put in my body and how I'm feeling. But I am, um, I do share my data with two of my close friends okay. and we're on a whoop team together. All right. Well, maybe I will be part of the whoop team. Well, I didn't as, say you were invited. Well, well, I, well, shit. <laughs> uh, politics and fashion tribe, I guess <laughs> we're going to start our own whoop team. No, of course you're but, invited. But, fuck um, you, I don't want to be in it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then what happens? Child. Musky old sweet potato head ass. He decides. His tater tot face ass goes on his platform that he bought that I think just to be hateful and nasty. And he says this, and I do want to quote it, you all. After Taylor Swift's Instagram post, Elon Musk says, fine, Taylor, dot, 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 you win, dot, dot, dot. I will give you a child and guard your cats with my life. Friend, thoughts. I just don't understand how he's able to say stuff like that and get away with it. It's so disgusting. It's so misogynistic. It's so gross. And offensive. And offensive. So we're going to tease out the misogyny and also the anti-Black racism, because we know this guard your cats with my life, that's also a dog whistle, okay? So the fact that someone could live on this planet and be in a female body and choose not to have children has these men and some women in an uproar. They are really upset. We've talked about this before, right, friend? So the fact that you could be childless by choice really gets under their skin. And I don't know if it's because they are like Elon Musk dedicating themselves to procreation because he does have 12 kids by three women. I mean, he's giving Cam Newton, him and Cam Newton must be in the same, maybe opposite sides of the political spectrum, but they definitely both like to procreate. Um, Nick Cannon. Uh, Nick Cannon, another one, him and his head wrap and all them babies he got. And so where this idea is coming from, that there should be a complete lack of bodily autonomy and that we exist to just have babies, we know what that harkens back to. It's nothing but the patriarchy, right? But the fact that he would say, fine, I'll give you a child, is so disgusting. It's also this kind of really nasty way of trying to take her own power away from her as if that's all she's waiting for like i don't i can't i can't even really unpack it right now but assuming she wants a child assuming she wants a child now assuming she, she doesn't have a child but wants a child all of those things margo she, assuming that if she wanted a child elon musk could not get close to her with a 10 foot pole who thought who would think to themselves i want to go on a hot date tonight and you know who i want to go with elon musk would you <laughs> would you would you think to yourself no 
on the cover of whatever magazine, the sexiest man on earth, he, no, would not get that job. I'm just saying how, no matter how subjective and problematic it might be, he would not get that job. Elon Musk is not someone that people are like vying for. And that- Well, I don't know if that's true. Well, you think people find him attractive, Marco? Um, I think that people find his success attractive. So then let's talk about that as well because I, mean, I think there are lots of things that make people attracted to to people and like i am not personally attracted to elon musk i think he has done he is a good example of someone who has done a tremendous amount that has changed our world in ways that we don't even we just think are normal but he has and that still doesn't give him permission to spew such vitriol and hate and violence. And there's something happening where, particularly with men, white men in power, Donald Trump does this all the time too. It just wouldn't be allowed if it were anyone else. So, uh, um, yes, and I think that's what you're talking about right now is the power that he has and the weight that his words hold and how influential he is as a multi billionaire and why in my opinion in the world they should not exist because we are watching successful white men like him who have these political sensibilities completely run amok and i think we're seeing the adult version of of temper tantrums mm -hmm. when you have a lot right. of money and power especially right and they're not getting the attention they want Right. And so what we learned as we were doing a little bit of research in preparation for today is that Elon Musk hasn't always been a MAGA Republican. He initially had left or leaning tendencies, which yeah. would make sense given that he is the CEO of an electric car company. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you would not think that he would be in alignment with MAGA Republicans, especially... Right. And then he didn't get the attention or the platform that he thought he deserved. And so he's having a temper tantrum and, and that's what Trump does every day too. Yeah, and, and so we have to also be reminded that much of, for example, the DEI blowback that we saw with the Harvard president, President Gay, um, and the way that she was taken down by successful white men, many of them, Elon Musk, Trump, as you just stated, they also are responding to just in general, a changing world and the dismantling that they felt was happening to the patriarchy and white supremacy. And they just can't have that at some point, God damn it, what they're saying is enough is enough. And if we have to use hate, as J.D. Vance just recently said, what do you say, Em? I I'll make things up. So this gets us to our next point, this idea of when something does, when the facts don't align, we just create the facts. And we're open about it. So all of this, I don't really even want to repeat some of the lies, but the lies about the Haitians who have moved to Springfield, Ohio. J.D. Vance on a national news network this past weekend, or the weekend of September 14th, depending on when this, this episode airs, said that even if things weren't verified, he would be okay with creating facts because that's what his constituents told him had happened, what had happened. He's okay with it. And this man is a, a was it Yale educated attorney? And Senator. And Senator, yeah. I'm just trying to like harken back to the fact that he, I mean, as humans, we know the difference between the truth and the lie, but you've literally been trained to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. And you're saying that's okay because your constituents want the lies. Um, and it, it goes back to Kelly, Kelly and Conway. You remember the alternative? Oh, alternative facts. Um, it's also Orwellian. But I think what you're also getting back to is the second part of Elon Musk tweet. And this is why we say it's, it wasn't just misogynistic, but it was also an anti-black racism, like dog whistle to folks who are believing around the immigrants eating the uh, the cats. That's why he said, I'll guard them. I will guard them with my life. From the people who are going to steal them and eat them. Who, oh, they happen to be Black. 
and immigrant. It is such an easy target. Um, and as Bernice reminded us in our live last week, that this is something that Haitians and Haitian immigrants have been dealing with for many, many years, not just because of their, them being the victims of Western imperialism, colonization, and anti-Black racism, anti-immigration policies, but also we remember back, Margot, the AIDS epidemic in the United States was blamed on Haitians bringing it to this country. So what better group to kind of target a group that is already like marginalized to the nth power, exactly. right? They're black, they're immigrant, they're poor, they don't speak English. And they're coming from a place where they've already been disenfranchised from economic opportunities. Um, for people who don't know what we're talking about right now, I just realized that there are some folks who don't know. So Margot kind of hinted towards it about these lies that have been going around social media, but also repeated by uh, people like J.D. Vance and Donald Trump during the debate, claiming that Haitian migrants or immigrants in Springfield were eating pets. Um, absolutely, the, the city manager came out or the county manager and said that there's no evidence of that whatsoever. Ever And I saw a lot of coverage about it on Democracy Now! this morning where people were talking about how afraid they are. I, 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 I saw the same thing. I saw an interview with a, a, a father who said, you know, normally I take my kids to the park over the weekend when I'm not working. And I was too scared to do that this weekend. Um, too scared. Children are being bullied in just very disgusting and reprehensible ways as well. And so it just reminds me that oppression doesn't hold any punches, right? Like this country wants to be stratified in the same way so badly that even children can take the brunt of it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We don't care that Haitian children are going to schools and also by teachers, by the way, being harassed and bullied. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we find a way to other a population to remain in power. To what end? That's the big question. That's the, that's, I mean, all of this is so despicable. And so, as you like, as you said, Orwellian, right? You couldn't even write this without laughing. Like if, if someone had told you five years ago that someone was running on a platform, that Trump was rerunning on a platform where he said that a certain population in a random city in Ohio was eating cats and dogs. He said, and they're eating the pets right now. They're eating the pets. But the thing about it too, friend, is the fact that the moderators were prepared to fact check that in real time. Let us know that like people know his playbook. They understand the party line. Speaking of the party line, can we talk a little bit about this anti-Black racism versus other forms of racism and how mm. Vance came out? Vance came out this week and talked about this right-wing, ridiculous influencer statements that were obviously racist and were meant to attack Indians. Yeah, so Loomer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so... I am new to Loomer, but it seems like um, the far right is not. Oh, they love her. She has millions. I looked her up, friend. Millions of followers. Right. So she's a influencer who's from Florida, I believe, has run for two congressional seats, has not won, um, cannot legally own a gun in this country because of psychiatric issues so one i would never make light of anyone's mental health issues but given how easy it is to own a gun in this country the fact that she can't own a gun should say something do you want to tell oh and there's also a lot of allegations that she's sleeping with trump child this just feels like a very disgusting and despicable soap opera um so this is who this person is. And now as somebody who is a professional content creator, the fact that I did not know who this woman was until this morning says a lot. And it, for me, is an example of the ways in which we are all experiencing our very own internets. And so we yes. have to do a better job, job of talking about these people because they have huge audiences, y'all, that 
they are influencing who are hanging on to every single word that they say. And while that may not be our political sensibility, that is how this mess, this disinformation, misinformation is just going viral. So she made a joke. I don't know how, you know, racism can be funny, but ha ha ha. Um, and said that if Kamala Harris wins the presidency, the White House is going to smell like curry and they will be doing press conferences from a call center. So that was obviously meant to take a shot at Kamala Harris's um, South Asian heritage and her mother being Indian. Margot, the one thing she forgot, though, or maybe she remembered, is who else is Indian? J.D. Vance's wife is South Asian. And you said that from the beginning. You were like, they're going to have a problem here. It just, it doesn't make any, I mean, I don't want to try to make sense of what they're doing because it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't even align with their own values. So it's, it's as though Vance is, it seems like Vance is running for president. I know. Oh, girl, not to sidetrack us too much, but the fact that Vance said before Trump that Trump would support, his presidency would support a total abortion ban. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. and, and Trump was like, I haven't talked to him about that. Well, wait a minute. He's supposed to be taking your lead, not the other way around. So yes, it seems like Vance is running for president. To your point also that if Trump wins, we know what's going to happen in another four years, who the next candidate is going to be. Um, so yeah, girl, um, I guess Sister, has her name pronounced Usha or Usha? Usha, I think. Okay, so Sister Vance was back in the corner, girl. She must have been heated about this because her husband then went on the news networks this weekend and said that that was inappropriate and he didn't like that. So let me just, you're okay with anti-Black racism. You're okay spewing lies and making up things about Haitian immigrants eating pets, eating dogs, eating cats. But we gonna we hey the line has to stop when we get to talking about Indians now that's just not what we're going to do. How does that make sense? It's again just this picking and choosing of whose lives are valuable. Very true. And what's an appropriate level of brownness? This is very true. Right? I mean, I I, I don't. I think we, I've said this before and like, I don't want to give JD Vance too much credit, but he, he is not, not intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. To go through three years of law school is hard. And, and to do as law school. Right. Among other things that he has done in his life. And so he did have to overcome and use critical analysis at some point. Now, what's happened to that, I, I can't speak to, but the picking and choosing of of who he can hate because of their skin color and who he doesn't yeah, exactly. is bizarre. But it's actually not, right? Because I think that he has drank the Kool-Aid of um, what it means to be a model minority in that myth. And there are lots of group, groups of people of color, not lots, but there are groups of people of color who get to be exempt especially when they are educated and have money. And that's why I think it's important to enter into the chat this idea of anti-Black racism, right? And what it means to be hated because of either you being a direct descendant of Africa or you being a descendant of chattel slaves in this country. Um, because it's a different origin story. And it is a different type of oppression, not to play oppression Olympics, but it the tone and the tenor just looks different. And we have got to be precise with our words because they're showing us in real time. And like when you marry that with anti-immigrant sentiment, anti-Central anti American sentiment, anti-Southern immigration sentiment, where people who cross the border, who are poor, who are coming from Central and South America in the islands it's like oh right this story writes itself for them yep Absolutely. because these poor people who've had to flee their homes and ended up in springfield ohio because by the way springfield ohio had no economy till the haitians came 
talk about this. And they were courted, right, to come into work. Of course, because Springfield, Ohio needed them. So imagine what it must feel like now for your neighbors. And I want to say even to be turning against you, because to be Black in this country, what I have learned, Margot, is there is an undercurrent of distrust. And it's because we never know when shit like this is going to happen. So you think to yourself, oh, that's how you always felt about me. You just have political cover now. You feel more comfortable saying the thing. And the internalized racism by Black people right now who are in Springfield and who are opining on this issue is shameful. It is you speak more about, about that? So one of the people that I heard in the Daily episode who got on social media, I think it was a Facebook post that the Daily was reporting on that was talking about this, was a Black man. And it is this separation that you can be the right kind of Black and the wrong kind of Black because we've been taught that. And so in my opinion, it is an example of internalized racism and anti-immigrant sentiment. Now, on the flip side of that, there are black immigrants who would also say, I'm not black like them. So our community experiences quite a bit of division. And so I don't wanna make this just about the JD Vances of the world, actually. There are black people who will openly also hold an anti-Haitian and anti-black immigrant sentiment, anti-African sentiment, absolutely. And that's the way that white supremacy works. It pits us against one another. So that's where we are right now, friend. Any other thoughts about what's going on with uh, Queen Tay-Tay, J.D. Vance, Donald Trump? I want to dream of a world. Like, I, I, I know this sounds like pie in the sky, but I want to dream of a world where we don't allow people, no matter who they are, to harm other people, at least publicly. I mean, also privately, yeah, of but, but I just am shocked still, even though I shouldn't, this is what we've been doing for the last 20 years of our career, right? Where we see people in power spew violence yeah. and people are like, well, they've done a lot of good things or well, they didn't mean it like that. Or, well, like, he was just joking when he talked about impregnating her. Or, you know, I was being sarcastic. Or, But, like, if anyone of a different identity said something like that, if a Black man said that about Ooh, Taylor Swift. Wow. Ch- think about historically. Right? Think pre- about, the- right? Exactly. Or, like, an immigrant woman said that about a white man and we just have to recognize when we permit people to say things that are just inexcusable can i ask you a question to that point yeah who holds them accountable and how could we i don't know i mean people boycott x people don't buy teslas i i i think I, you can't be a billionaire. I mean, there's lots of different, there are lots of different checks and balances as a society we could create to hold people more accountable. And I think that's the conversation that we need to be having moving forward because we're so far gone. These bitches are running a fucking muck. We are so far gone, Margot, that it has to be about not allowing billionaires to even exist, in my opinion. If someone's going to say that's such a socialist socialist value, and I'll be that. Yeah. I think there's also value in having these conversations without the goal of canceling people. Mm. Like, what would a restorative conversation look like? And I'm not, say, not saying I'm a Elon Musk supporter, but, like, yeah. Elon Musk has done a lot of good things. And, by the way, we have three I think people stuck up in space right now and the only way they're gonna get home is because of Elon Musk NASA can't do it yeah 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 the only reason that we have so many electric cars on the road even though they're so annoying and you can't charge them unless they're Teslas (laughs) and all of that but (laughs) I have my own electric car story um not a Tesla I would say my (laughs) Tesla but um is because of Elon Musk and so and 
he's like a violent racist, a violent anti-Semitic person. He spews a ton of lies online. He has created X as this place for far right yep. violence conspiracy theorists. I don't know. There's like, we could do more. Don't you think? It's, it's tough for me because I think some of these people are so far gone. I want them to be on an island by themselves. Like, I don't even know how to bring the Elon Musk of the world back. And so, in my opinion, your politics and the sword that you shield can be so fucked up and told by Ashy. I don't want anything to do with you. You're too far gone. You cannot be brought back. What scares me more, though, are the people who are listening to him. And those are the individuals that I want to figure out how to reach. But it actually has to start, to your point, with figuring out a way to muzzle this xenophobe, this misogynistic, like, people like him are inciting violence. Yes. And, them. and you were telling me that the Proud Boys showed up in Springfield. This, so this is what I'm saying. So I'm talking about waking up day to day, wanting to take your children to school and having a serious like fear, you know, that, that you will not be able to come home, that your children will be assaulted by those who are supposed to be protecting them. And so should we in general have a call in versus cancel culture? I can agree with that. But also there is something about what he is doing that feels criminal to me. I agree. And then the question is, I agree. But then he's canceled. Where does he go? He doesn't just poof into nowhere. He goes to the people who were supporting him more publicly. And now they're doing it underground. So they're doing it through tour. They're doing it through discord or signal or, you know, it's canceling. Cancel culture is, is a product of a lot of things, but it's not as though these people go away. Yeah. N yes. Yes. And uh, I'll say again, I think the Elon Musk of a world are going to have to be in a separate category. I, no, I'm with you. Right. So so while we have to figure out how to deal with them, the goal is to create policies and practices practices so that another one does not emerge because he has way too much power. And what I was mm -hmm. thinking about recently was how I mean, people like him have become the face of the capitalist corporatocracy. And in, in many ways, he has more power than the fucking government. He and has more power than Donald Trump. This is true. So if Donald Trump wins, Donald Trump is not going to be leading this country. It's going to be J.D. Vance. It's going to be Elon Musk. It's going to be Mark Zuckerberg. And that is what we have created in this form of U.S. unregulated, privatized, neoliberal capitalism. And... Um, I'm not trying to be fatalistic, but we should all be really, really fucking concerned right now. Okay, my friend. Well, that was fun. <laughs> okay, we got it. We got it. Uh, so we haven't done this in a while, but we used to end our episodes, particularly our harder episodes with like, what's one thing you're going to do for yourself? That seems stupid right now, but <laughs> like, what are you eating for dinner? Oh, this is a good one. Um, I'm taking my grandparents to Bar Taco Girl. So I'm going to probably oh. have a very strong mezcal margarita. Um, but I'm excited to take my grandparents there because my grandmama is like Southern food to her core, as you know, Margot. So she likes like two restaurants, girl. And Bar Taco is one of them, thankfully. I love Bar Taco, too. Um, I am making lentil soup and a roasted chicken. Okay. Are, are you still taking your bone broth from the roasted chicken? Or... Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, I mean, not always. Like, I just have my bone broth in here, but um, I will make a bone broth. Yes, thank you. Oh. Okay, all right. Oh, do you do you eat rice? Mm -hmm. You do. do. Do you make rice with your lentil soup? No. Try a little bit of rice, girl, or put a little bit of yellow rice with that thing. In the soup? No, like you put it on the side, and then you take your soup, and you just oh. cook it up. Yeah, you know, I'm from a Southern culture. Culture. <laughs> So we like a little bit of Laurie's. <laughs> Our producer saying in the chat, Laurie's. What are Laurie's? Which is hilarious to me that producer Roger knows anything about Laurie's. <laughs> what are Laurie's? He's, he's from Texas. 
Very true. So this is to your point, Margaret, where you say a lot of times that Southerners can have more in common. Well, no, I just say, I, I just, it's just so interesting. And like, I, I, I do believe we have more in common than we don't have in common, but I think there is such strong identity politics also that have to do with the region of the country that you're from. Sure. And the South and the Midwest in the middle of the country have a lot more in common than the coast. Oh yeah. No, that's, that's real. I mean, think about California. Um, because I don't know if a white man in California would be like, oh, yeah, add some lorries on it. <laughs> Maybe. I've never, he- I've never heard of lorries. <laughs> it's seasoning salt. It's seasoning yeah. salt. Okay. Um, well, I like seasoning salt. I mean, no, you, you were don't. the. You don't even yeah. you don't put salt on nothing. So stop lying. <laughs> okay, guys. It's been real. <laughs> Love you guys. Thanks for listening to Justice. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to learn more about our podcast, be sure to check us out on our website at justicepodcast.com. You can also reach out to us there if you want to be featured on the show or if you have a business or a product that you think would be a good fit for our audience. Thanks again for listening.